Okay. So welcome everyone to our Rutgers Earth Day at Home webinar series. This is a presentation by Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Please remember this session is being recorded and will be available after the program in the next couple days uh, for rewatching or if your friends missed it. And just so you know, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of the university. We bring the knowledge and information gained at the at the university out to the local level. And right now, under pandemic conditions, we are doing that via online programming. So thank you for joining, especially on a beautiful evening like this. Um, so we are doing this webinar series, Rutgers Earth Day at Home, so that you can take sustainable actions at your home and on your property to be more environmentally friendly. And so we are happy that you're here. We're very excited to, to have this series. And uh, this is our seventh um, episode in the webinar series. So please check out our website if you missed any and would like to see some of the recorded sessions. So now, real quick, I'm going to go over uh, how we are doing this session tonight. Um, we are on WebEx. And if you have questions for the presenter, please write them in the chat box. I am joined by a colleague, Angela, who will be helping answer questions. Um, and also, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Amy Rowe. I am the county agent for Essex and Passaic Counties for Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And as I said, Angela will be joining us to answer questions. And I will introduce our speaker in a minute, still going through a couple of our uh, logistics here. So in order to get to the chat box to ask questions, you'll see a little cartoon bubble in the top right corner of your window. If you click on that, it will, it will take you to the chat box. And you can type in there. And we will be relaying questions from the chat box to our speaker. And as I said, to Angela, our speaker support here. Uh, so please, yes, please use the chat box. Don't be shy. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. So thank you for your patience. And also, everyone should be muted on entry. If you are joining by phone, please mute your, your phone so we don't have any distractions for the speaker. Uh, also, we will be doing a survey at the end of the presentation. So make sure that you press Submit when you are done with the survey, or otherwise your answers won't be recorded. And just look for the poll. It should pop up about 10 minutes prior to the end of the talk. Um, and we will be, we will just be, be taking some information from you and seeing what you learned. And Michelle will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, finally, the Rutgers Earth Day at Home webinar series is free, but please consider making a donation to our program. We will put the, the link to the donation uh, website uh, in the chat box. And you can take a look at that. Anything that you could donate would be appreciated. Um, but we hope you're enjoying our Earth Day at Home webinar series. And we really appreciate you guys being here again on this beautiful day. So let's get down to it. We have our esteemed colleague, Michelle Backus, here today. She is the county agent for Middlesex and Union Counties for Rutgers Cooperative Extension. She has been working on invasive species management for a long time, uh, working on New Jersey invasive species. And she knows a lot about both invasive species and native species, not just plants. Uh, but insects and all kinds of thing as well, things as well. But she will be talking about specifically invasive plants tonight. So please welcome Michelle, and I will hand it over to you. Yes, you sound Thank great. Thank you, Amy. You hear me? OK, great. Um, for that intro, um, and welcome, everybody. I'm excited that you're, you're here. And I'm going to be talking to you tonight about invasive Plants. We're going to be talking about invasive plants, and we're going to talk about the issue of invasive plants, and then give you some, some native alternatives for, to think about putting in your landscape. Um, I Just one correction to what Amy said. I've, I'm, I'm definitely more of a plant person. I, I, kind, of, I kind of like things that don't move. 
always has a have an issue. I'd love to be a better birder, but they just move so fast. So so plants I like because they kind of they move slowly, and and I can ca keep up with them basically. I also want to mention that we have Angela Monahan with us today, and I'm so grateful for her uh, being here with us. Angela is the Rutgers Middlesex County Master Gardener Coordinator, and she's going to be answering some, helping answering questions in the chat box, and she just is a wealth of information about, about native plants. All right, so let's get started. Before we dive into, I apologize for the wordiness and insanity of this slide. Uh, you are not expected to, to read it in any way depth, but I do need to make sure that we get your consent to take part in this research study. Rutgers considers this, what we're doing right now, this webinar and the poll question that you're going to answer at the end to be a, a research. So it doesn't reach a research project. So it doesn't mean that we're going to come and poke you and prod you. It simply means that we're going to annoy you by, by emailing you. <laughs> So, so you, uh, it is, it is a, a um, it means that we're going to collect information, your name and your email, you know that from registration. We're going to keep that information confidential, not share it with anybody, uh, but us, the researchers, and also our, our records, our um, uh, human subjects compliance people. You do, it is, it is your choice to, to take the poll or, or not. Uh, so at the end of the poll, if you could please uh, give con consent if you agree to be part of the, the research project. Thank you. All right, so now we'll go on to look at pictures of, of, of plants. <laughs> so here's our, the outline we're going to be talking about, uh, just, just getting on the same page for some of our terminology in terms of invasive and what does that mean, exotics, natives, we'll do that quickly. Talk about the problem a little bit, why invasive plants are a problem in New Jersey, and then we'll go through our our, our, our plant this, not that section. Uh, so I'll give you some alternatives to think about. And then I'll give you some resources for doing an, what I call an eco rehabilitation on, on your yard if you, if you choose. Okay, so let's just go through some of our terminology. So a native plant, and, and if you know this already, I know from, from experience from being on this, this webinar, uh, we've got some great people on here with us who, who know a whole bunch, and then there's folks who are just learning this for the fir for the first time. So if you know some of this stuff, just just be uh, be patient with while we get through it. But a native plant is a plant that it historically occurs in a certain ecosystem, and so that native plant it typically what, what the the way we it, it's generally agreed that a native plant the United States has been here before European colonization. A native plant has competitors and usually diseases and pests that help keep the population in check so it doesn't grow out of control. That's a native plant. And then an exotic plant is a plant that's brought in from elsewhere, uh, usually as a result of human activity. And that introduction can be done uh, intentionally. For example, this was the thing to do for a long time. Time, right? But time people, wealthy people would travel around the world and then it was very popular to bring back ornamental plants with them and display them in their gardens. Botanical gardens that do this have done this for a long time also. Uh, so that is one way that, that um, we got we, we have exotic plants. And but then the other way could be by accident, for example, through many people don't realize that one of the main ways we, we have exotics introduced in this country historically was through ballast soil. So that held down the uh, ship that came into ships that came into the port of Newark and Elizabeth, and then that ballast soil was was dumped and dumped by Newark and Elizabeth, and all those seeds were were uh, traveled. You know, this was an entry point for travel throughout the, the United States. So we have native, we have exotic, and now so what does the term invasive mean? Well, the federal government has this de definition for an invasive. It's an invasive species is a species that is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction is likely to cause economic harm or environmental harm or harm to human health. That's an invasive uh, species. And we're mainly going to be talking about invasive plants today, but just know that an invasive species can, can be a plant, it can also be an animal, it can be a fungi, it can be a pathogen, or a, a disease. So maybe you've heard in, in the press a lot on um, issues with spotted lanternfly or emerald ash borer, um, and maybe you've heard about invasive fish that that uh, you know getting into the Great Lakes. So 
but uh, so, so, so they can, it, invasive spawns are lots of different category. Per the Invasive Species Strike Team, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit more about that organization in a little bit, but in terms of plants, in terms of invasive plants, there are approximately 1,000 non-native plants documented in New Jersey. But most of those are considered to be non-invasive at this point. So just because a plant is exotic does not necessarily mean that it is invasive. In fact, most of the plants that come into this country uh, do not end up being invasive. There are just a couple of them that kind of grow out of control and cause all sorts of problems. So per the, the invasive species strike team in New Jersey, there are about 90 species of plants that are considered to be emerging as a problem. And then there are 30 that are widespread. And you probably know, you may know some of them if you're, if you drive, you know, in your, if you drove at all today, you, in central Jersey at least, right now the one that's most conspicuous is multiflora rose. It has that beautiful white flower and you can really, this is the time of the year that you can really see that it's all over the place. Uh, so that's a, considered to be a widespread species. In this picture here on the right, you see garlic mustard. That is also considered to be a widespread species because it's growing absolutely everywhere. It's already here to stay, and there's, we're never going to really eradicate it. The most we can hope for is just to control it. But on the left is a shrub called Linden, Linden viburnum, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And that is an exotic shrub. And it is now emerging in New Jersey as, as an invasive plant. We're, we're seeing this in our forest communities, and it has the potential to one day become widespread. Um, so this cartoon here is just you know, showing that, that uh, there's, there's lots of different invasive. There's the invasive emerald ash borer. There's the Asian carp. But also humans really are sort of an invasive species also, aren't they? And they're causing a lot of the, the, the problems that, that we have with invasive plants. Really, you can, you can um, make a direct line between the problem of invasive species and, and, and the, the, the activity that humans do on the landscape. OK, so before I go further, any questions about that? Okay. So far, so good. Can you hear okay. me? All right, so uh, then no I will just move yet. on and feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. So why are invasive plants a problem in New Jersey? There's, there's lots of reasons, but there's two main reasons. Um, the, the first reason I'll talk about is the issue of habitat fragmentation. So on the picture on the left here, this is an aerial photo. And you can see that we're looking at different types of land uses here in this aerial photo. And hopefully you can see my arrow. So in, the, in this aerial photo on the left here, you can see that there's some houses here, right? There's a road. This house seems to have a pool. But then there's also a farm over here. There's another house over here. And then the rest of this is all forest. All this green is, is forest here. And in New Jersey, that is what naturally the land wants to be. It want, everything wants to go back to forest. Uh, so when you stand out on your lawn, just, you know, you can look at your lawn and say, this, I, I'm keeping this in, in, as grass, but it really wants to be, it really wants to go back to the forest. And what we've done here with all this habitat fragmentation and land use changes, we've created all of this edge. Look at all this edge that's, that's going on here with, along the farm fields, along the, 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 the homes where the, uh, the homeowner property, there's all this edge and increased surface area where invasive plant seeds can make its way into the forest, the core of the forest, where it never used to be able to before. So that's one reason that, that uh, invasive plants are such a problem in New Jersey, is because we fragmented the landscape and created all these new opportunities for invasive plants to move in. Excuse me, Michelle. Yes. We can't see your arrow. I think okay. you need to click the top left. Do I need to actually? OK. Now? Yeah. Um, Is that better? Okay. I, I don't really need an arrow. Don't. This was the only okay. slide where I really needed him. All uh, right. Sorry. Hopefully, though, for my explanation, you can see that, 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 that where, where we've kind of taken chunks out of the forest, you can see that there's a lot of edge along that forest, and that's where a lot of the invasive uh, seeds and plants make their way into the, the forest core. You know what else likes um, edge habitat? Deer deer like edge habitat also and, and we have an, the other reason why we have such an invasive plant problem in New Jersey is because we have a huge problem with overpopulation of deer. Um, a appropriate 
population size for deer, a healthy population size, is about 10 to 15 deer per square mile. But there are many communities in New Jersey that have something like 100, 150 or more deer per square mile. And deer do not eat invasive plants. They do not eat the multiflora rose. They don't eat Japanese barberry. They don't eat uh, burning bush and a lot of the shrubs that, that are causing problems in, in, our, in our forest. What they eat is the native plant. So under normal circumstances, if there wasn't this added deer pressure, our native plant communities could they, they could they could compete. They could um, compete with the invasive plants that are moving in, and in some cases they could even outcompete or at least help keep the invasive plant populations in check. But when there's this added browse pressure, there's so much browse pressure on the native plants by deer. It it really doesn't give those native plants a chance to, to thrive because the deer are selecting those native plants. And that's why a lot of our, our native plant communities are threatened by the invasive exotic plants that, that have moved in. Okay, so moving on. So what are the impacts of invasive plants in, in New Jersey? So the, the economic impact, and this is actually across the country, this number here, the economic impact of invasive in general, and now I'm talking about everything, I'm talking about invasive animals, invasive flora, invasive fauna, in, in, across the country is a $137 billion problem. Uh, that's the economic impact, because it's not just forest managers that have to deal with these invasive plants. It's also farmers who have to deal with competition from invasive pests when, when they move in and have to uh, manage them somehow. It's it's uh, cattle ranchers out out west, where you know they're invasive pests in and they're eating um, invasive plants that you know they're not able to digest. So this is a huge problem for all different types of industries across the country. And in terms of the ecological impacts, my background is in watershed protection, and there's also aquatic invasives. I'm not really talking about those today because we're really just focused on what people can do in their own yards. But there are, like anyone who lives in the lake communities in um, the north, you know about the issues with Asian watermill foil and aquatic invasive plants that, that uh, clog waterways and alter nutrient cycling and cause problems for recreation. But then one of the biggest issues with these invasive plants is that they reduce overall biodiversity. And when I use that term biodiversity, what I'm talking about, I'm not just talking about the number of species that are out there. I'm also talking about the interaction between plants and animals and, and the soil. These invasive plants do not support local food webs. So take these pictures here that you see. The one on the top is Japanese barberry that is formed what's called a monoculture, and the one, uh, the picture on the bottom is of winged burning bush. And this is my son here who's um, photobombed this picture here. So what you're seeing here in the shrub layer are monocultures of just one species. And that's what a monoculture is. It's a community made up of just one plant species. And we were walking on this trail here, and as far as you can see, walking down this trail, on the bottom picture is all burning bush. Is all, and we kept walking and walking, and all we saw was, was burning bush. And this is what a lot of our forest communities look like now. And you may say to me, well, you know, there are some, I mean, burning bush and, and uh, a barberry, they, they, do have a, they do have a fruit, they have a berry, and that berry, you know, is something that, that birds can eat, so there's some benefit there. But what you, you need to have to understand is that this one species has probably outcompeted. There used to be probably 15 other shrubs that would uh, that lived here, and then they offered food to, to birds and wildlife throughout the year, and they also offered uh, resources for pollinators throughout the the year. And now you have this just this one species here. It would be like it would be like you and me going to the supermarket in June. And then stopping, stocking up for the whole year, and, and you know that that just can't um, isn't possible. So that's what happens. These these invasive plants come in, 
form a monoculture and really do not support local local uh, food webs because most of um, most of pollinators, most wildlife, they really they can't do anything with these invasive exotic plants. So if you're thinking, well, Michelle, you know, this is New Jersey, and we are the dense, most densely populated state in, in the country, and of course, you know, that's going to have an impact on nature. Please know that there are just so many good things in New Jersey to protect. This, uh, these next couple of slides here, Mike Van Cleft, who's with the Invasive Species Strike Team, he let me borrow them because I just love how they show the diversity in New Jersey. We are blessed in New Jersey to have these different physiographic regions. We have the, the highlands and the Ridge, Ridge and Valley section of New Jersey and northern New Jersey, and we have the Piedmont and the coastal plain, and all of those different regions support different fauna and, and flora. And, you know, there's a, there's a carnivorous pitcher plant here and um, pink lady slipper orchard or orchid. We have the Piedmont, we have the Pinelands and all these different habitats with all the different uh, plants. So look at the New Jersey uh, can boast of 2,000 native species and 1,000 non-native species. We have blueberry here and laurels. And then look at all the fauna. Also, we have 62 land mammals. 44 different species of reptiles, 336 different species of marine fish, 180 different species of dragonflies and damselflies. And all of this uh, fawn, all of these animals depend upon native plants in order to survive. Okay, so before I jump to questions, uh, so far, people just want to know when is the plant this not that starting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's going to start I'll get to the good, get to the good thing. Okay, so as far as what you can do, um, so one of the first things I would say that you can do, you can support the work of the Invasive Species Strike Team. And this is their website here. And this is a statewide cooperative effort to prevent the spread of emerging invasive species across New Jersey. So, so this is a this is it's, it's, um, it's mostly volunteers. It's a network of organizations across the the state who work together to detect new invasive plants and other in, invasive species in New Jersey. And when they find one, they go in and they eradicate it. They use a, a system called early detection rapid response. I would encourage you to look at their website. But then the other thing that, if not right now, then right after this presentation, you should go and download their do not plant list, the, in, the strike team's invasive species do not plant list. And this is a list that you can print out or you can bring it on your phone with you. And um, when you go shopping, for plants for your yard, and you can cross-reference to see if the plant that you want to buy is an invasive exotic plant. And you can make the decision to choose an alternative, something that doesn't cause problems for a local ecology. So I definitely, definitely recommend that you download that plant list and use it when you go shopping for plants in your, your yard. Other things that you can do, understand that plants do not know boundaries. They sometimes will say to me, oh, Michelle, this, you know, I don't see this barberry sp uh, spreading in my yard. That does not mean that that barberry is not quietly invading the local uh, forest community because it does have a fruit with a seed that birds like to travel with. Um, think about removing invasives from your property. At the end here, I have kind of a uh, how to get started. We'll talk about it more then. And choose choose natives. I, I'm talking to you today about native plants because this is, you know, Earth Day at home and we're we're trying to save the world here, people. So, so that's what I'm talking to you about. But um, there are many ornamental cultivars that you could also use. Um, I'm just saying, be careful that it's not an invasive ornamental cultivar. Uh, and and you, everyone should be thinking about in, incorporating more native plants into their landscape, and especially having a diverse yard with lots of different plants that can support biodiversity. And then uh, support, talk to your towns about putting in place native plant ordinances or, or invasive plant ordinances and eventually statewide bans. And then I put here just some new uh, and 
and proposed legislation that you can look further into. Uh, so, for example, this one here, 227963, was signed in 2017, and, uh, which, which makes it to the New Jersey Turnpike Authority. Pennsylvania Turnpike Authority can, can only use native plants in their roadway landscaping. And this is another one here underneath, which is proposed. I'm not sure what the current status is, but it would prohibit the sale and distribution of certain invasive plants. And Connecticut, some of the states around us, Connecticut, New York, they're, they're a little further along than, than we are uh, on, on this, so, so hopefully New Jersey will catch up. In terms of finding native alternatives, we have a bunch of resources. I have my favorite thing is the Jersey Friendly Yards website. If you have not looked at their plant database, then you are missing out. Um, there's also the New Jersey Native Plant Society, their, their website. Each one of these has, has um, native plant nurseries. And what I would encourage you to do now in the chat box is if you can, if you have a native plant nursery that you love, please go ahead and put it in the chat box along with what town or the county that it's in. So if people are nearby, then they can, they can visit it. I would tell you to call that nursery before you go and also talk to your native plant nursery because they are always very well informed and they could give you an alternative. You know, I want to remove this burning bush from my property. What can I, what can I replace it with? Okay. So here we go. Here, here's the list of the of plants that we're going to be talking about today. And just, I, I want to, I don't normally do this, but I'm just going to start out with an apology. And, and, and I am actually pretty happy that you are where you are and I am where I am, because this is usually the part of the, the talk where people get kind of mad at me. I realize that, that people love some of these plants on this list. And uh, I too am, am connected to a lot of the plants um, in, in my in my yard, and um, I'm sorry I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry if, if if I upset you with with this list, but but we hopefully we can find you an alternative if you uh, decide to, to if you have it in your yard and you decide to remove it. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is calorie pear or Bradford pear, the Pyrus calorie caloriana. So this is quite has become quite a problem in New Jersey. Um, you drive around in around April in New Jersey and this is all that you see in old fields that's that's flowering now. It used to be that we had black cherries and um, cedars and things like that, but now a lot of times the only thing that we see is calorie pear that's that's flowering. So calorie pear was was um, very, very popular like in the nineties, planted as a street tree, was originally brought for uh, breeding for fruit trees. And it has this nice symmetrical shape, right? So it was great as people really thought it would look good as a street tree. And then it has this pretty white flower in the spring. Uh, and then it has this, this droop, this uh, fruit, um, which actually is very, very smelly when, once it drops. The problem with, with calorie pear, well, there's a number of problems with it. Where do I start? Uh, one of the problems is that uh, it has a very, you, you blow on it in the wrong direction and the branches break off because it is a very weak um, uh, branch crotch. So that caused all, all sorts of problems with branches landing on, on cars. The other problem was we were told that it was sterile. We were told that Bradford pear was a sterile variety and it turned out that the individual cultivars are sterile, but those cultivars turns out can, can cross pollinate. And um, they, that's what spread into our, our forest communities and into our old, fear, old fields. And now all of, a lot of our um, um, fields look like this in the, in the spring, where um, it's just you know, all, all calorie pear. And I, took, I, took a, took a lot of my, I take a lot of my pictures on my commute to, to work. I pull over on the side of the road. And this was one on Route 130. And this is as far as you can see here, this is just all calorie pear. And there, there's not a whole lot else growing here. And this isn't how succession is supposed to take place in New Jersey. So what are some alternatives if you live in a community where there's lots of, uh, well, actually, I'm not there yet. Hold up. I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to go through one other tree. The other tree that's, so, so, so um, if you see an E here, it means emerging. And the W means widespread. Um, so I believe uh, a Japanese maple is also a, an emerging invasive plant of concern, Acer palm matum. And I mean, who doesn't love Japanese maple? It's such a beautiful statuesque tree. You, typically a, um, you know, in, in a 
people like small trees for, the, for their front yard. And these two species I'm talking about are, are often there, but this one is also one that we're starting to see invade forest communities. Um, it's the palmatum that's, that's the problem. There is a japonicum that seems to be okay, but I could not tell you the difference between the, the, the two. Okay, so what are some alternatives? One is, one alternative, if you're looking for a small compact tree for your yard, uh, Thursus canadensis, maybe you already know redbud, um, I, a lot of my slides are going to look like this, where they're going to have a couple of bullets to tell you whether or not it's deer resistant, because I know for some of you, you're interested in that, and then the type of habitat it likes, if it's full sun, full sun. This one is full sun to shade. It has this beautiful, it's in the pea family, the Fabaceae family, so it's very, very pretty. If you grow peas in your garden, you know what the pea flower looks like, and it also has a, a pod. Um, and then it has this beautiful heart-shaped leaf. Um, I would say if you're going to get this uh, get this tree, then you should get the green leaf variety. Do not get like the purple leaf variety. In, in general, purple leaves on on a plant are typically a cultivar, often not necessarily native. And if you're looking to increase habitat in your yard, um, provide habitat for caterpillars and birds and wildlife. Um, then that purple leaf variety of plants is a problem because it has this chemical in it called anthocyanin, and um, caterpillars, you know, cannot cannot uh, eat leaves with with um, that chemical in it. So get the green leaf uh, variety if you're looking to support local ecology, support local birds, support caterpillars and butterflies and pollinators. And, and are you? Do you have a question, Amy? Is there a question? Hey, Michelle, so there is a question in the chat about Japanese maple and um, burning bush. So burning bush and Japanese maple, I've had them for 10 plus years and neither have spread. Why shouldn't these be planted? Yeah, so, so um, Japanese maple now is just emerging as a concern in New Jersey. Sometimes that happens where you have, I'm just talking about Japanese maple right now. I am not talking about, about burning bush. So, so it's possible to have a species that seems to behave itself. And then environmental factors, climate change, um, you know, a species just has to kind of a, a, adapt locally and suddenly we find it, you know, slowly invading a forest. Now, as I said earlier, just because it's not spreading in your yard does not mean that it's not spreading into local forest communities. Burning bush is one that you, it's difficult to go into a forest in New Jersey now and not see burning bush. Um, you know, pretty much every hike that I go on in, in local forests and local natural areas, you know, you see burning bush in, in the understory. So the, the you know, um, Burning bush has, has a fruit, it has a seed, birds eat that seed and they spread it, they spread it around. That's, that's, the, way, that's the way it works. Um, so again, just because you're not seeing it in your yard, you know, if you're mowing your, your lawn and you're, you're weeding and things like that, you may not see it spread there, but, but that's just how it works. Those, those seeds spread into the local natural areas. Other questions before I go on? Okay. So I'm going to keep going, hearing no questions. Um, Wait, so another Michelle. native alternative, yeah? I'm sorry, I've, I'm having trouble. My mute is delayed. Um, so there's a question about managing Japanese knotweed, and I don't know if you want to address that now when the question has come or later in the presentation. Um. I'm not going to that that it's not necessarily one that people would plant in their yard. Most likely people are trying to eradicate Japanese knotweed from their yard. But go ahead, what's the question? So the question is, how can we manage it due to restrictions in handling Japanese knotweed as yard waste? Um. Um, so, so well, this, this is, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard. I, I, um, it would be one where you would, there's, you would cut it down. It's one, if you have a big patch of it, then if you have a small patch of it, then if you can 
take it out mechanically, that would be the best way to go. And then if you have a large patch that you may have to use some sort of herbicide, but you should be able to bag up, cut it down, bag it up, put it in black garbage bags and put it in the garbage. Um, no one should be, all invasive plants that you move, remove from your property should be bagged up and put out with your regular garbage. Nothing should be brought so you're, like we in Hamilton, I live in Hamilton, we have a local ecological facility, and I would, would never bring them an invasive plant because it may spread into the compost that they make there. So you just bag it up and put it in the, in the garbage. Other okay. questions? Thank you. That's it for now. So another native alternative, if you're looking for a small like tree in your yard, is a common service berry or shadbush, Amelanchia arborea. Um, this is a beautiful tree. It, it flowers at the same time that it's called shad bush because it flowers at the same time that when the, the shad are making its way, uh, migrating upstream. Uh, it has a beautiful white flower. In April, it can deal with full sun to part shade. And then it has this very, very pretty uh, purplish berry later on in the season. And that's like, it's kind of a big shrub or a small tree. And I've seen it both, both shapes. So that's a nice option also. Okay, so moving on, another one that is quite a problem, has been a problem for, for a while, and this is one that I've got, gone to battle with, is uh, Japanese wisteria. There's also a Chinese wisteria. Um, wisteria is very, it's also in the Fabaceae family or the bean family. It has this big, purple, beautiful inflorescence. Where I live, it, it was just flowering and it, it's starting to, it's starting to decline. It's flowering. It also kind of flowers at the same time as, as Calpa. People sometimes get that confused. But this is what it does. It's a vine, and it grows up trees, girdling and killing the, the trees. Uh, so, so it does have a beautiful, big purple inflorescence that I know people love, and they love it on arbors. Um, but it is, it is quite a, a problem. So there is some great alternatives you're looking for. For, in terms of wisteria, there is a native uh, alternative. There's wisteria frutescens, which is American wisteria. And it's sometimes hard to find at native plant nurseries. I took this picture at Bowman's Hill Native Plant Nursery, which is in New Hope in, in Pennsylvania, right across the, the river. Um, so that would be a nice one. Um, it doesn't have as large, as obnoxious a, an inflorescence as the Chinese and Japanese wisteria, but it's still quite big and very, very beautiful. Uh, so that would also be very, very appropriate for, for an arbor. And you can see here it flowers from, from June to August, full sun to, to part shade. So that's one option for you if you're looking for a vine. But another great option is uh, Trump, our native honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle, the one that's flowering now is that where you walk in the woods and just has beautiful floral scents. It's actually not native, unfortunately. Um, it's native to Japan. Um, and it is a huge invasive exotic problem. Uh, so trumpet honeysuckle, you also may see it as coral honeysuckle, uh, Linosura sempervirens, uh, is a great vine, uh, has these beautiful pink flowers. You can see on the left here, I bet you can figure out what um, pollinates it and what loves coral honeysuckle. I, I have, and I am enjoying right now the hummingbirds coming to the coral honeysuckle in, in my yard right now. And it uh, grows pretty quickly when it's happy. Uh, this is about a year. It's, it, I have kind of an, an arbor here, and it's growing along the fence. And um, it, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, just a, it's just a great, it's, beautiful, it's a beautiful vine that I would definitely um, suggest that people look for. OK. Uh, moving on, another one that is a problem is Chinese silver glass, Chinese silver grass, or miscanthus. And this is an emerging concern in New Jersey. Um, so, so this is a, is, a, is a grass that has this beautiful upright structure, a very symmetrical upright, upright structure. It looks beautiful blowing in, in the breeze. But it's becoming quite a, a problem. This is a picture of it down in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park where this gentleman is trying to remove it from the forest. It, it invades like uh, forest edges and roadsides, um, like uh, um, storm drains and swales along roadsides. When it dries, it's a fire hazard. So it's a real concern. 
Um, so, but we are lucky in that we have some wonderful native grasses that you could replace this with in your landscape. Um, this is on the left. I have I have two different types of grasses that you could consider. One for upland kind of dry areas and one for wetter areas. The one on the left is a uh, little blue stem, little blue stem, and this is a very very pretty grass. Has a nice um, upright kind of symmetrical structure, and uh, it flowers in August, and then in the fall it has this beautiful purple hue on the on the on the uh, on the on the flower. Uh, it does need full sun. It does need full sun, and so that would you could use in a drier area. It does not get very tall. It gets like maybe I've seen it like two feet ish. Uh, or less. And then the one on the right is one of my favorite plants in general. It's soft brush, soft brush or juncus effusus. It likes it wet. In fact, we use this a lot in rain gardens at the base of the rain garden. Um, it has high deer resistance, so that's great if you that is a concern for, for you. And this would be one that would be appropriate uh, to put for example, if you have a downspout, you could put this, it really does like to be inundated every now and then, completely inundated with water. So you could put this at the base of your downspout with maybe some rocks there, and it would be very, very happy there. So those are two nice alternatives for, for grasses. Okay, going, kind of jumping around a little bit here. Here's another vine issue. Um, English ivy, Sarah Helix, and winter creeper are also both emerging invasive plants. That uh, invasive ex exotic plants that are that are causing problems. Uh, so these are, you know, very very common ground covers. I I, I realize, uh, but we see them as a problem anywhere there where there are ab abandoned houses, moving into forest communities, and just out, com out competing everything in its in its path. Both, both of these. So alternatives. If if you want something aggressive like like that, like the Eng English ivy or the winter creeper, then you could use um, uh, uh, Parthenocytus. Oh my goodness, I can't remember the, the common name right now. I don't have a slide for, for this, and maybe Angela is going to put it in the in the chat. But the um, Parthenocytus is equal, I'm for some reason totally blanking on the common name of that of that vine. But I will, I will get back to that. Uh, so here's some other uh, ground covers if you need some, some ground covers. Uh, so one is Acerum canadense or wild ginger. Uh, this is a picture on the, uh, the, both of these pictures are from my yard. And I really, really love the, this herbaceous plant. It has these very, very pretty heart-shaped leaves. It grows kind of slowly. So I would say if you want to cover a large area, then you should buy quite a few plants. But I started with a small patch of maybe three plants, and it 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 spread. This is maybe you know two or three years later that it that it really started to spread out. And it does have it does have medicinal qualities. Supposedly the root has a ginger flavor, but at the base of the stem it has this very very pretty flower in April and May that you probably wouldn't even notice if you looked for it. It's pollinated by ants. And even flies that are kind of attracted to that like dead meat sort of uh, color. So, so this is a really nice alternative as a, as a ground cover. And then another, if you want the evergreen aspects of like a winter creeper or a English ivy, then then bearberry may be one for for you. This is one that is an evergreen. It has high deer resistance, so that's really great. And it's has uh, flowers in April and May, and then has this very, very pretty red fruit, which is just very, very attractive, especially in this kind of rock garden kind of situation. Okay, other questions before I move on, Amy? Okay, so a couple people want to know how to remove English ivy if you don't want it. Well, this would be one that you would, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. This would be one where you would be calling in Calling in the troops, you know, maybe bribing some, some neighbors, something like that. If you want to do it mechanically, then, then it's going to require shovels and gloves and a lot of pulling and removing. One thing that you could do, if it's, if it's the kind of situation where it's grown up a tree, where it, which it often does, uh, you can go in with, like, clippers or a saw and cut it high 
um, and then cut it. You're kind of cutting a chunk out of the vine on all around the, the tree, and then the upper part will kind of die off, and then you're just removing below below the, the tree. But this is also one where if you have a huge area, then you may have to use uh, an herbicide, and uh, so that we, you would do like a foliar spray on the the leaves, and uh, it would it would die that way. Okay. Now, a quick question: How does wild ginger do in clay soil? Yeah. So, wild ginger, I, it would do, I think, okay in in clay soil. I believe it it can it can take different uh, it can take different soil types. And this would be one that if you if you have questions about soil if you have specific questions about soil types, the best place to go for this is the Jersey Friendly Yards website, and you can customize that website with your, your soil and it'll tell you, you know, what plants would be would be the most appropriate. You can and you can actually say I would like a ground cover, I have clay soil and uh, and and it will tell you what plants would be most appropriate. But I think the wild ginger would do fine. Okay. And also if you guys see in the chat our dear friend and colleague Becky has just posted the Jersey Yards uh, website. So thank you, Becky. Yay. She is Becky. Uh, I've noted Jersey Yards what like five times already. <laughs> <laughs> she is fastidiously answering questions for us. So thank you, Becky. Uh, but now, Michelle, I have a real zinger of a question for you. Is Pachysandra an acceptable ground cover? Oh no, Amy. <laughs> Amy, Amy said. Amy said the the word. <laughs> My least favorite Sorry. word. Okay, so it needs to oh, be answered. <laughs> I know. I know. I I Amy knows. Amy knows that personally, I am not a fan of Pachysandra because I I've, I've had to battle it out. It it is. I don't believe it is as much of a problem as English ivy or winter green. Um, you could check. You could check in terms of its invasiveness. Um, in terms of habitat, it doesn't provide, a, you know, a whole lot of habitat value if that's what you're going for. Um, but I don't believe it has. Uh, it is, is as much of an issue with its invasive qualities. And the best place to check that out is that invasive plant list that I told you about previously. To look on that list and to see. You know, is is this a, a problem? Or you could go to the Invasive Species Strike Team website and see um, and see uh, you know there if it's listed as an invasive plant. But I, I don't believe it's it's at that height of a problem. Even though I personally am not a fan of it. Was that okay. was that okay? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, also, people want to know how to get rid of lesser celandine and Japanese stiltgrass. I've had several questions about this. Okay. Okay, folks. So for that, those kinds of questions about like the the, the bad the bad boys out there, like Mycostegium and lesser celandine, let let me do that at the end. Okay, let me do that at the end. It's 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 a matter of vigilance. It's a matter of vigilance. Going back every year, um, paying mapping it out, figuring out where you having it, removing silk grass is easy to pull out, uh, but then you will have to go back every single year. So, so I will I will take those at the end, uh, those types of, of questions, okay? Um, so another one that uh, is I usually get thrown rotten tomatoes at me for um, is butterfly bush, Buddleia, uh, the Buddleia genus or the, the butterfly bush uh, uh, cultivars. So, so this is a problem for a number of reasons. Um, I, I know that people really love this plant, and why wouldn't they? It's absolutely beautiful. It has this huge inflorescence. It's a very strong inflorescence also, so butterflies can, can land on it, so it's a great uh, landing platform. It also does provide a nectar source for butterflies, and my neighbor has one. I've created this whole beautiful pollinator garden in my yard, and and I'm always yelling at the butterflies in my neighbor's yard, hey, come over here, look what I've created for you. The problem with butterfly bushes, one, is that it's very clearly becoming invasive in, in New Jersey. It invades a roadside habitat and, and spreads and outcompetes native plants. Um, so that's one issue with it. But the other issue with it is that it, it provides a, a it provides just a nectar nectar source to butterflies. Butterflies 
cannot complete their life cycle on the butterfly bush. So you probably all know the butterfly life cycle, right? Butterflies lay an egg, and then a caterpillar uh, hatches from that egg. Um, and then the second that that caterpillar hatches, it has to eat something. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it can't eat butterfly bush. So, so all it does is provide a nectar source, and a butterfly has to find something else that's going to keep its caterpillar, caterpillars, baby caterpillars happy. So, so this, though, I mean, we have so many wonderful options for native alternatives for, for butterflies. First of all, if, if you are looking to increase habitat in your yard, then, then you look no further than milkweed. Um, these top two, the orange one and the one on the right, are milkweed. Um, I would say the one, and the one on the next slide, I have another milkweed slide. The one on the left, butterfly weed, Esclesius tuberosa, uh, is probably more appropriate for a yard than the common milkweed. Common milkweed, it gets very tall. It does have this big, big pink snowball inflorescence. Butterfl monarch butterflies, you know, they, they really do like common milkweed, but Butterfly weed or Scoopius tuberosa is is also a, a wonder wonderful uh, option for your for your yard. But then on the bottom here is Joe pie weed, and that is also a wonderful. If you're looking for a tall, big inflorescence of pink in your yard to replace the, um, the butterfly bush, then Joe pie weed would be a great option for that. And Joe pie weed has really nice deer resistance, so that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. I have it in a part of my yard that's kind of part uh, part done, and it does just fine. And it's it flowers in the summer in July. And then the next slide here is my favorite milkweed plant, which is swamp milkweed or Asclepias incarnata. And um, I just love this this plant very 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 much. This picture I took on the left is uh, the monarch butterfly caterpillar. And I came home from vacation, was mowing my lawn, and I look over and all these there were all these happy little monarch butterfly caterpillars munching away on the swamp milkweed. Uh, swamp milkweed does like it wet, but I have it in a dry area of my lawn, and it does it does just fine. And it does also have high deer resistance, so that's good too. Okay, so some other now we're going to get into the shrubs with the little bit of time that we have left. Amy, yes. Hi, Michelle. Would you like to start the poll? Oh, sure. Okay, folks. So um, I'm going to open up the poll. Um, it, it's going to stay open for about 15 minutes. You can start answering it, or you can start answering it in about five minutes um, when, when uh, you know, I get through more of this, this presentation. All right, so I see that you're starting to, to, to answer these questions. So one, these, these, some of the, some of the uh, ornamental viburnums are, are a problem. And we have many native alternative, many wonderful native viburnums that are a great option. But, but Linden viburnum and Siebold's viburnum are both exotic varieties of viburnum. And especially the Linden viburnum, I'm seeing a lot in, in forest understories as an exotic invasive plant. It has this red berry here, um, and the, the leaf of the viburnum is uh, the leaf of the linden viburnum. It can be all different shapes. It looks a lot like arrowwood viburnum, and all, but it has um, very varying leaf shapes. And also the leaf is kind of fuzzy. And then the one on the right is a Siebold viburnum. So both of these are causing problems and they're considered to be emerging invasive plants. But we have some great native viburnums. We have um, American cranberry bush. We have possum hall which I just got from my yard. I'm pretty excited about it. We have black haw viburnum. Um, this picture on the left here is maple leaf viburnum, but this is kind of the time for viburnums. We have a lot of viburnums that are flowering right now, and this is just the only picture that I could get of, 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 a, of a native viburnum. Uh, but they all have this beautiful white inflorescence, um, a little bit of deer resistance. They, they do well, full sun to shade. So if you have to replace a viburnum, then know that you have lots and lots of native options. So now burning bush. And, and I know people love burning bush for that red, beautiful red color in the fall. It's also very easy to maintain and has great deer resistance. But this is one that's really causing a huge problem for, for our forest communities. Um, I showed this picture earlier. 
here's some more picture of winged burning bush. It has this kind of off, off opposite leaves, these off opposite uh, leaves and has a red berry in, in the fall. And then there's that beautiful red color that you see everywhere, absolutely everywhere in the fall. And it has these quirky wings along the major stems. Sometimes it can be recognized that way, winged euonymus or burning bush. But we have, again, some nice native alternatives. Virginia sweet spire is one that I would recommend. If you're looking for that fall red color, then Itea virginica has beautiful purple fall color. Uh, and on the left um, is the inflorescence, which is happening in central New Jersey. It's happening now, the inflorescence. Um, it's about it's flowering now in my yard. And uh, it does like it a little bit wetter, but honestly, I have it in a dry part of my yard. It's doing fine. It's just growing a little bit slowly. And every now and then when I think of it, I just kind of dump some, some water on it. So so that's a nice alternative. But and okay, so now that we'll talk about barberry. Bar Japanese barberry is another big problem. The picture in the background here is is the barberry in a forest understory where it's completely invaded and taken over everything. The, it, but this is the purple variety that people also often have in their landscape because it creates nice contrast with the rest of the, the plants. And I understand that. But it's also evergreen, deer resistant. It has these spatula shaped leaves and this red berry and, and fall and then these, these thorns. So when removing this, it's, it's really quite a problem. Um, so there's other problems with Japanese barberry. The research has shown that it kind of changes the, the, the soil acidity, to make it more hospitable to other barberry. And then also ticks, it creates a nice little environment for ticks. There's a lot of research that shows that ticks prefer to live in Japanese barberry. So if you're looking for evergreen, evergreen to replace your barberry, then there's two that I would recommend. Northern bayberry, um, Morella pennsylvanica, this one has nice deer resistance. Um, grows full sun to part shade. It grows quite, quite tall. Also, it can go like I think up to 12 feet. And then it has those bayberry fruits on it later in the season that people, you know, like to collect and make candles out of. And then there's also inkberry holly, Ilex glabra, uh, which is also a nice evergreen and it has fall berries on the, on the female. Both of these are dioecious, but similar to holly, um, that meaning that there's female plants and there's male plants. And you need both of them. You need the female and the male in order to, to get the, uh, the fruit. Okay, so other questions before I move on? I'm close to the end. Yeah, so there's a lot of chatter about plants, all kinds of recommendations, lots of Jersey Yard links. Um, okay, so let's talk about. All right, go ahead. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad that. I'm glad for all the chat, and I hope this, this great community that we have here can help other people um, plant native plants in, in their yard. Um, so, so uh, um, and thank you to, to Angela, who's, who I know is answering questions out there. Uh, so how to get started. So, so there's a few things to do if you are are watching this and you're thinking, oh man, I'm I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know where to start. I have a lot of these plants. So if you want to do this, if you want to replace your invasive exotic plants, the first thing I would do is talk to your spouse or partner about this. Um, don't be me and have your spouse wake up on a Saturday morning and hear the chainsaw going, and uh, you know see me taking out some shrub that that he didn't know about. Um, to discuss this with, with your partner, discuss it even with your neighbor, because if you're going to be removing lots of plants, if, if you're like me and you live on a small piece of property, then you may be changing the landscape. And I'm not suggesting that you ask them permission, but, you know, I want you to keep neighbor relations nice. So just it's an opportunity to educate them about what it is that you're trying to, trying to do. Um, and then also inventory your yard, and you have lots of good resources for this. Like you can call your local extension office, and you can reach out to your local master gardeners. If you don't know what some of the plants are in your yard, if you're unsure, reach out to them. Here's the county website, and you can send them a picture, describe it to them, and they can help you figure it out. There's also some great resources with apps like iNaturalist, and there's a video here, an iNaturalist um, YouTube video that I would 
short video, wonderful talking about this app and how it can be used to identify plants, and then also you can be a citizen scientist and help researchers around the globe with figuring out um, where different species are. And then, uh, if, but, but you may also, sometimes people say to me, you know what, it's really too much for me and I think I need a professional, and that's fine. You can have a horticulturalist or a gardener come in and help you ID plants. And we have the Rutgers Organic Land Care Database. I will put a shout out for, and you can search that database by county, and that's professionals who have gone through the Rutgers Organic Land Care Program. You can use that database to find a landscaper. And then I would recommend that you make a plan and don't go crazy. Just do maybe like one or two species a year or one or two um, um, shrubs a year and make sure that you have an alternative to replace it with. Don't go chopping stuff down before you know what you're going to put in its, its place. Uh, research local native plant sources for alternatives and then experiment in your yard. You don't have to get this perfect. You know, you do, I do a lot of experimenting in my yard. An, an, an ecologist at Rutgers, an eminent ecologist in my graduate school program told me that he learned more from doing work in his backyard than any of his research projects. And I think that's absolutely true. You, you are all, I dub you all scientists and researchers because if you, if you have a place to look at plants, you, and that's what you, you are. Uh, Okay, so other online resources, the New Jersey Invasive Strike Team. This is a great brochure, this Plant This, Not That brochure from Union County. You can download that, that's, that's the link. It does just what I'm doing here. It tells you about invasive plants, gives you an alternative. I've already mentioned Jersey Friendly Yards, the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. This website here, Native Wildlife Foundation, the Native Plant Finder, I can, this is my new favorite thing. Bless Oh my goodness, so exciting. This is from uh, the National Wildlife Foundation. It's based on the work of Doug Tallamy, and you can put in your zip code, and it will give you a customized list of native plants that support, support, support the most amount of pollinators, butterflies, caterpillars, things like that. It's really a lot of fun to play around with, and um, the fact that you can cut, it's customized by county is really great. And then we have a fact sheet at Rutgers incorporating native plants into your residential yard that you can look at also. And then lastly, maybe you're, you're, you're saying, I need more. Maybe you're saying, I want to I know more. I want to learn more. So this is just an hour, and I wanted to talk to you about so many more things, but I only had an hour. So some other online learning uh, webcasts that I would definitely encourage you to watch. Um, they're, they're recent. So one is uh, Mike Van Cleft did Deer Resistant Native Plants for Your Garden. Um, that would be one on YouTube to watch. Really, really good. Another one is Desiree Narango, who um, is a researcher out of the University of Delaware, works with Doug Tallamy. She did one for Eco Landscaping called The Chippy Guide to Gardening, Why Native Plants Matter. I, I could listen to her. I just want to download her brain and just like listen to her talk all day. Another great uh, recording is Pinelands Nursery, their whiteboard, they do a whiteboard ecology series, really short snippets of information. And this one was done by Fran Chismar, who's just a wealth of information. And he talks about the importance of local seed prominence, uh, provenance. Sorry, I couldn't get into that today, but that's something to think about and why it's so important to support your local nurseries who are getting their seeds locally. Another one is Angela did a fabulous webinar last week, Creating a Pollinated Paradise in Your Yard. And then the New Jersey Native Plant Society webinar series is uh, coming. They're having a monthly webinar series that you can um, look at and sign up to. And then pretty much anything with Del Calamy uh, on YouTube would be, would be a good listen also. Okay, and now I'm, I'm happy to take any, any questions. I also wanted to just tell you about my favorite native plant, which is this blue-eyed grass. Um, Cicerin, Cicerin, I can never say the Latin name, I'm sorry. It's, it's new, narrow blue-eyed grass. It's growing in my yard, and it's beautiful right now. It has these beautiful blue flowers with these, you know, stripes here that just tell bees where to go right into the, to the yellow center to, for, their, for their reward. Okay, so... Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that haven't been answered or need me to answer.
Oh, plants, uh, Phragmites. Okay, so removal. Uh, Japan, Japanese stilt grass. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So let, let's let's start by talking about removal methods. Um, so so I yeah I, I didn't really go into your basic removal methods of a lot of the invasives that are out there, uh, Phragmites, stilt grass. Um, a, a lot of these, you you if you have a small patch and you can get it out with mechanical means then that's just a matter of getting out there and removing it every single year so you can remove the seed stores. Um, you can also use things like black plastic and things like that to just choke it, it out. But that, that's if you have, a, that's if you have a, um, a small patch. If you have a large area, then, that's, then you're talking about needing to use an herbicide, um, cutting it down and then using an herbicide uh, to either do a foliar spray or you could do, use like a cut stump method. There are different techniques depending upon the plant. And the invasive species strike team on their website has a whole list of invasive species and the best method, methodology for removing it. So for shrubs, what we normally do if it's an invasive shrub like barberry and it's a large tract of area, we will do what's called a cut stump method where we will cut it as low to the ground as possible, and then we will just dab on uh, a, just a little bit of an herbicide, usually like something, a glyphosate-based or a triclopyr, some, something like that. You have to look at the invasive species strike team to figure out the best time of year for the species to, to treat it. And then also, you absolutely should read the label thoroughly and read the directions on, on the application. But for, for shrubs and for trees, that cup, cut stump method is a nice way using an herb where you only use a very, very small amount of herbicide to get at that. Hopefully that helps. Uh, it took about one minute to finish, so go ahead and finish that up. We appreciate your feedback. Um, okay. Uh, so what else are people asking about? Uh, people want to know what is the pollinator for blue-eyed grass? Oh, well, okay, maybe you can help me. Again, remember, I, if something moves, I usually have a problem with it. But I've seen bees uh, come to it. Um, there's a little, like a little, I, I, I couldn't get a great picture of it, but you may be able to see on this picture here, there's a very small bee, almost like a sweat bee that's, that's on here. Um, so very, it, it's a small flower, so it gets very small pollinating um, uh, insects that, that go to it. I, I love it for a couple of um, reasons. One, it, it was this particular plant, blue-eyed grass. Um, I, it has sentimental value for me. It was the first native plant that I found in my yard. It had volunteered, and I recognized it. And I've protected it over the years from the lawnmower and my kids going over it. Um, and now it's just spreading. And right now is when it's, I've seen it when I've been hiking. I've seen it flowering now in the wild also. It's a great one to have. It's, it's, it's actually in the iris family. It's not a grass at all. It's in the iris family. So, so it looks as a grass-like blade, but it's, it's not a grass. Okay. Is it that the Arbor Day Association has seedlings that could be on the avoid list. <laughs> I um I'm not sure who's asking that question, but know that know that I have sometimes asked that question also. Um, I I think when what I was what I was told is um you know they're they're trying to get plants that uh, do well in urban areas. Um, and also sometimes it's a you get what you get and don't get upset kind of kind of thing that they're just providing what they can what's available to them. Uh, but but I, I, I mean I think the organizations that do that are just trying to do the best that they that they can to get as many trees out. But but I agree they should. I, I can't think of, actually I actually I take that back I can't think of any specific time where I've seen them giving out invasive trees. But I've seen uh, trees that that just may not necessarily do anyone very good like crab apple trees or something like that. I, that's not that's not a, my favorite tree, but I, I think it's a matter of they just, you know, give out what they what they have available. Other questions? Uh, let's 
see about all kinds of and success. Um, I think uh, there was very early on. I didn't want to interrupt you, but why doesn't New Jersey ban invasive plants the way that Pennsylvania and other states do? So I, I thought about putting in a slide about that, but I I know how how savvy this group is and how they ask really good questions. So I figured I figured that question would eventually come. I'm. I'm hoping we're almost there. I'm, and the environmental community is hoping that we're almost there. That that legislation that you saw earlier, and we will send these slides out to you as a PDF, and also the recording will be available on the on the website, uh, the Earth uh, Earth Day at Home website. All the recordings are, are there, but um, we're just we're just New Jersey just isn't there yet. There hasn't been either the the policy will or the the political will yet to to do it. But but hopefully we will be there there soon. Um, and uh, you know Pennsylvania has done it. New York has has done it. So so hopefully hopefully we'll, New Jersey will do it also. That's all I can really say about that. You know the, the nursery industry. A lot of these plants are very important. Barberry and um, and burning bush and their 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 staple plants and people are used to being able to buy, you know what whatever they they based on aesthetics and based what they what they want to see in in their landscape and telling people that they can't sell certain things I, I think is difficult, uh, but hopefully we're we're almost there. Okay, does blue eyed grass hide your resistance? I. You know, I don't have a lot of deer pressure where I am, but I don't believe that it that it does. I believe this is would be one that you would have to protect. Okay. And how about removing lesser celandine? Oh, the celandine. That's right. So, oh boy, celandine is rough. It has those tubers. It's one of the. This is normally a three-hour lecture, and I go through different. Um, different reproductive strategies for invasive plants and why they're so successful. And lesser celandine is one that, I mean, it takes it takes the, the cake. It, it has those underground tubers. I think it also spreads by seed also, I believe. Um, and that is, again, one that's vigilant. It's a matter of digging it up, trying to get as many of those tubers out as, as possible, and going back to it every single year. And uh, if you have it, usually it likes wet areas. But if you can get in there with a with a mower, you know, um, take if you have a small patch, just going after it every year, not letting it go to seed, removing those tubers as many as you can, and then this is also one where if you have a large patch, you may have to do some sort of foliar spray uh, to to get it, and then just be consistent with it year after year. Okay. Um. How about what is a good ground cover by a driveway that's in full sun? Um. Well, uh, the, well, the 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 wild ginger that that I mentioned earlier um, actually likes it kind of shadier, but the other one that that I mentioned likes it full sun, I believe. Uh, let me just go back. Uh, it's the bearberry. Uh, but then all, the Virginia creeper, oh, that's the one that I. That I could not re re remember. If, if you're OK, if you want something that's going to grow quickly, um, then the Virginia creeper would be one that would probably do well. It's more of a, a, a forest that would may like more of a full sun to part shade area. I'm trying to think of some, an, another one that's for, for a ground cover. Um, there's some nice grasses that make some nice ground cover. And then there's also the, the option of just, you know, there, there's not a lot that's going to replace that, that kind of English ivy where it just, you know, it's so incredibly dense and it, it you know, has that thick evergreen leaf. So there's also the option of just planting like like low flowering plants, for example, um, a phlox. You know, like a like a low growing phlox would be good also. Uh, 
Okay. Is Canadian thistle invasive as well as exotic? Is it neither? Yeah. Canada thistle is uh, exotic and it is invasive. And that would be one to, to try to remove. Um, and a good resource for looking at what, uh, in, in addition to the invasive species strike team website to see whether or not it's an invasive, um, is also the Mid-Atlantic Invasive uh, Council. They have a very nice, oh, I may have it right here. They have a very nice publication that they update every couple of years with new invasive, oh, I do. Here's it, hopefully people can see it. Plant Invaders of the Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas. That's online and it's free. You can download that and uh, uh, that's updated regularly. And that's one kind of official that's, that's in there. All right, one question about how to remove bamboo. Um, with, <laughs> with difficulty. Uh, I, bamboo is, is one that, man, you may even need heavy, heavy machinery for that one, or at least a lot of people with a lot of shovels. If, if it's a large patch, I've seen it removed with like a, 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 a you know, some, some heavy equipment, like bringing in a very small dozer or, or something like that, um, or loader. Uh, but then if it's a small patch, then you have to dig down and get that root ball out, get, get all that, that root ball and uh, make sure that you, you stay on it uh, year after year. So it the method depends on how much of it that you, that you have. And again, looking at the, um, the strike team's website and their recommendations for the, the individual species would be a good thing to, to do. Okay, well, that seems to be pretty good. Um, just some comments about different plants. Becky is still answering some questions for everybody with the Jersey Yard site. Uh, so thank you, Becky. Um, uh, so I think that concludes our Plant This, Not That conversation. Thank you for coming. We're uh, very excited that you stayed on this beautiful evening. And hopefully we will see you next week. We will be sending out the resources um, as well as the slides and look for the recording as well. So thanks everybody. We appreciate you coming. Thank you so much Michelle. So that, thank you so much Becky and thank you Angela for answering questions. I'm going to stop the recording and we will on. I'm going, I'm trying to stop the recording. Where is my recording? Here we go.